because what I realized was when I started working then in the corporate world as a consultant doing um, what we called a high impact communication program, but it, it embraced color and shape and style and body language and, and business etiquette and everything about who you were when you walked in the room. Did, did you own it or did it own you? And that, that was where I really got into my flow. I love what Pauline says there. Did you own it or did it own you? And that's a great metaphor for the business world, working for yourself and having the right attitude and mindset. And as Pauline has talked about in this interview, when she was doing kind of image consultancy, are you going into the room, let's say at a networking event, and feeling confident and owning the room instead of the room owning you? And I see this so often in the business world where people are just not owning it. And it's a real shame because we have so much to offer and so much to share with people that we meet. Anyway, Pauline's interview with me here is really, really covers so many different facets. Her journey has just been incredible. And what she's doing now is so appropriate. In fact, she's been doing it for a while. She was way ahead of the kind of Me Too movement and with her whole research and understanding of gender dynamics in the corporate world. It's just so super interesting. I don't even know where to start with it, except to say, enjoy. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast, Pauline. How are you today? I'm really well, Michael. How are you? Yeah, I'm brilliant. And like you said to me in the interview that we had uh, a few weeks ago, you said, I'm in the USA and you're in the UK. So I'm in the UK <laughs> and you're in the USA. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I'm in the morning and you're in your afternoon. That's right. Nearly evening here. And, you yes. know, the weather is atrocious here at the moment. We're having oh. like storms and trees falling over and oh uh, not good lots of rain and there's more storm on the way and they're kind of saying oh no yeah that's, it's like that is well the, when the weather's really lovely here um it's it's slightly <laughs> cooler than it was a month ago but uh, yes. it's, it's a very very wonderful temperature never really gets cold cold so where so, tell yes. people where you are pauline <laughs> I'm living in yeah. Orange County, and Orange County is uh, in California, wow. uh, just below LA County, and it's a very open and, and pleasant county. Uh, it's the freeways, you go on the freeways and you can see the mountains, and you're about, on a good run, you're about 25 minutes from the beach. Um, so it, it's pretty good. It's, yeah. uh, it's a very green land, and uh, the place that I live in has got lots of trees, so feels very gentle. Brilliant. That's a, that's a way of describing it. Well, that uh, sounds gorgeous. I can't gorgeous. even imagine at the moment what the cold is like. <laughs> no. Well, good, good on you. Good on you. That sounds brilliant. Well, I start my podcast off with the same question every time, just to get us in the flow of things. And can you share with the listeners a little bit about your personal life? So that means where were you born? Um, a little bit about your education, um, the kind of journey to where you where you now live, where have you moved around, and then you know we'll transition into the first job and your kind of career yeah. thereafter. So over to you, Pauline. Okay, Michael. Well, uh, to start with, I never imagined that I would end up living in California as I am at the moment. I was born in London, um, but not in central London. Um, it was in North London, suburb London, and uh, I was born there um, some years ago, just after the war, 1949. So I was part of a very, very happy Catholic family. We lived in Finchley, which was um, 
a, a borough of London. And in fact, it was famous for me being born there and also famous for it being the borough that Margaret Thatcher became an MP for. Those people who know Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of London, of England. Um, but my my whole childhood was was based in that area. I went to school there. In fact, I went to the same school from the age of four to the age of eighteen. It was a, a Catholic grammar school, girls' school, um, and I was a, the third of four children. So I have my older brother uh, Michael, my sister Anne, and then me, and then my younger brother Peter. And essentially, I had a very um, a very cosseted, lovely, happy family life. We, we would go on lots of family holidays together. We all went sailing. We would have picnics. Um, it was, in many ways, a very, very fortunate uh, start in my life. Great. Curiously, I was I was known as a rebel of the family. <laughs> um, not quite not quite sure how I got that um, title, but uh, I was a bit of a tomboy and as a mathematician. Uh, and an artist. Um, I was very bad at spelling, um, but I really loved life, people and I loved connecting and I loved chattering and um, I was happier climbing trees than I was uh, being a princess, but that, that will be relevant to my later story. Yes. Um, but I left home at 18 and I went off to university in Exeter University, which is in the West Country of England. Um, I had no idea what I was going to do. I, I applied to do sociology and statistics, which was uh, quite difficult. Um, and that was partly because I was a mathematician. I thought statistics would be uh, a good thing to do. I found sociology really interesting because it was all about people. And, and I realized, you know, my life is all about people. Um, but my my time there was, was magical. Um, I met my what was to be my first husband when I, I actually met him on the first week of my experience there. Can you imagine that? The first wow. week, the first, the first dance I went to, <laughs> I met him. And we, uh, we struck up a great friendship and turned into a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship. And uh, when we left university, uh, he was a Yorkshire man, uh, but he came to London and I went back to London and and then I realized that I had to get into some serious things like working. Mm. <laughs> so, um, you know, that was a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, yeah. But, you know, this, is, this was the 70s. And for those people listening who are of my age, you know, it was a very, it was a very enlightening, open, opening up our eyes to all sorts of things. You know, um, I wasn't a hippie, but, uh, you know, I definitely went to the odd um pop concert which was in the in the great outdoors and sat on the ground and watched Steppenwolf and things like this. <laughs> um and I and I listened to the Beatles who were, you know, then quite famous. I was madly in love with Paul McCartney uh, when oh. I was a teenager. <laughs> well I love Paul McCartney. I'm still a massive yeah. fan. He... Um, he, he he was just a, he was just a cute one. You know, I, I didn't you see, I, I quite like the Stones music, but I didn't like the Stones because they were too rough, the Rolling Stones. Mm. I was very much a Beatles fan. Same here. Um, and I loved, um, I loved to, the music, the era. Mm. Um, and I was very fortunate. And I think, to be honest, when I think about my journey that's led me to here, I've always been very fortunate. Not, not always a smooth path, but always fortunate. Um, and I got my first job with a holiday company called Thompson Holidays. And yeah. it was it was a new industry. And it's interesting. And when I look at my life now, I've always hit new and pioneering industries. Wow. I've, and, and some people listening might think, oh, but, you know, package holidays. And the time I met, I went to Thompson Holidays, package holidays were brand new. You know, people used to have to organize their own flights, their own hotels. This was the first time that organizations like Thompson's and uh, Horizon and Clarkson's, I can't remember all the names, but there was a boom of companies organizing people's holidays. So the idea of a package holiday came into being. And it was it was a good fun seven years there, a uh, very lively um, mixed community, boys and girls. And I always laugh because, the, you know, the boys were in suits and the girls were in hot pants. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not all of them. I wasn't, but you know the the the, the style of the era, the mirror, uh, mini skirts. You'd either have a mini skirt and then a, a coat to the ground, 
or and, and big sleeves. I mean, the whole fashion era was fun, mm. and and I really enjoyed that time. And it taught me a lot about business, marketing. Uh, but it was it was really the the sort of for me it was just a part of my journey towards getting married, having children. So I had a very kind of traditional mindset, I think, in those days. Um, yes. Because I came from quite a traditional family. Sure. You know, my parents were married forever. They were always in love for sort of 62 years. They Their marriage lasted. Wow. And they were a great role model to me about loving intention and uh, being in a, a, a well-grounded family environment. Mm. Uh, so I... I did marry my university boyfriend uh, in 1973, and we got married. And I remember, you know, I I didn't wear a veil, so I was a bit of a rebel. My mom was a bit <laughs> upset. I wore a, I wore a hat, but I did have a white dress, so, and we did get married in a church. Um, and then, and then my my journey headed off, um, really into motherhood. But I, I we went we left London and went to the West Country to Bristol. And right. that's where we had our two kids. So Ben was born in 77 and Gemma in 79. And my husband worked for a car motor company, but he was in training, in training and development. Right. And I I stepped into the role of being a mum. Mm. And, you know, that that's was tra very That's training and development as well. <laughs> well, absolutely. Yeah. And, you, you know, no, nobody tells you that parenting is actually the most difficult job in the world. Oh, totally. Uh, because... You suddenly have, you know, you have um, individuals dependent on you, and you to start with, you have to do everything for them, and you have to learn <laughs> learn what their behaviour is about, and uh, how to deal with them when they cry or they're sick or uh, they won't eat their food. Um, but generally, I, I did I did really enjoy being a parent, a mum, but I also felt restless. I wanted to do something more, and I loved designing. So I actually started uh, designing clothes, and wow. I had learned to be a dressmaker when I was a little girl. My mum taught my sister and I, and being being a mathematician and artist really helped me being a dressmaker mm. because you know that was it was all about putting things together. So a, a piece of fabric is flat, but yes. I could see it as I could see it as a garment, and I know you know about garments and clothes because you were in the textile industry. That's right. I just, I my my greatest pleasure was to go into a fabric factory, mm. <laughs> and I could spend hours and buy fabric, which sometimes I never even made up. But I just loved having, I could see the fabric as a garment. I know, um, I know. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. And well, that's what about that's what we had to do visual. too. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and what I realised then was some people just couldn't see that. Mm. So it was it was part of a, what I realized was one of my natural gifts, which is where the kind of maths and art came together. See, my favorite role model there was Leonardo da Vinci. Right. Because Leonardo da Vinci is a mathematician artist, and, and, and putting those two things together create substance. It's, so re it's really, substance, you know. Yeah, I know. And it's really it's, interesting that you should say this because I, I was just, I'm part of a, a, a like a support program in Birmingham called STEAM, and uh, mm -hmm. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Maths. Ah, and, yeah, yeah, and I like that. Rather than the STEM that everybody is well, familiar with, STEM. yeah. So it's STEAM now, right? I like right? that. That's a lot. That's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And so it all kind of fits with what you're saying, really, about the art and the maths going together. And the other thing is the the coat of arms for Birmingham City, which I'd never really seen before, has two characters on it. On one side, it's a painter with a with a palette and a paintbrush. And on the other side is an engineer. So... They already had when whenever this city was founded. I don't know. I need to look it up, but they already had these two. And I'm of course I'm not that far away from Birmingham City here. So um, 
So I'm, I'm just kind of getting into that space around actually the engineering and the art going together, like the maths and the art going together. And Absolutely. And, and you see maths and, and music go together. Yeah. Music is very mathematical. And in fact, maths is the substance of, of the universe. And, you know, everything created is created from a straight line on a curve. Mm. So actually my favorite part of maths was geometry. Right. I also love I also love simultaneous equations. I think that says something about me. It's like, you know, how do you how do you align variables to each other and work out solutions? Mm. It's that kind of mindset to connect the dots. Yeah. But the, the geometry and, and I did like geography, it was all about how do you map something out? How do you make it become three D? Um you you know, the substance of a cube is about straight lines and space. The substance of a, of a sphere is is a circle and the space. So the line, the circle, the straight line, the curve, the space, that's what I, our universe is made of. Mm. And it became very apparent to me that, that that was my skill. I wasn't a pure artist, you see. I mean, I could, if I really put myself to it, I could take a piece of paper and I could sketch something in front of me, mm. but it's not something I desire to do. I tend to draw shapes. Yes, um, and and create things which are are from shapes, and that's where dressmaking was for me. Yes, uh, and then the connection with the body that went into it. So what happened when I when I had my um, my period as a mum, I was also searching for who I was because mm. I love being a mum and I love being a wife and a, and a housekeeper, but I also like the the buzz of business. Although I hadn't quite really worked that out. No, because you know I was at home. My husband at the time was earning very good money, so I, I didn't need to work. I did small bits of dressmaking for people, mm -hmm. even when my son was crawling around the floor uh, making. I remember making a wedding dress for somebody. Um, but the idea of just staying in that space didn't really feel right, no. and I had this urge to kind of do something. So what happened? Uh, I went back to college. And it was very interesting. I, I, I can't remember how old I was, to be honest. I mean, I must have been in the late 30s. And, and we'd moved from Bristol to the country. We'd had five years in the middle of the country, which was very – it was a lovely experience, but quite alien for me because I'm a city girl. Mm -hmm. So we were living in the Cotswolds in a tiny village. Um, and curiously, one of my best things was connecting people. I was the source of all information in the village – Sounds like I was a gossip, but I wasn't. Uh, people, <laughs> people knew that I would uh, I would know things, so they'd phone me up and say, oh, do you know what, what was happening there? It was kind of like it was before the internet. I was the kind of mini village internet. It's called the Oracle. You were the Oracle. Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what happened was I we moved back towards um, London, but to Buckinghamshire, to Amersham, and yes. uh, I felt the urge to – learn something. So because of the dressmaking, I went back to college and I did a City and Guilds uh, fashion and design course. Right. And it, it was a year's course and I learned the side of pattern cutting, mm -hmm. which is fascinating because I've been making clothes for a long time by just buying bought patterns and then chopping them up. Yes. But what, what I realized was that it wasn't, I was making things, but when I put them on me, I still didn't like them. And there was there was a gap. I was thinking, this is really weird. And now you see, in life, I believe things turn up for a reason. I was sitting in the college one day, and somebody said, "Oh, we're going to go off to Missenden Abbey to this event." Yes. So we all paid our five pounds or whatever it was, and we went off. And one of the speakers on stage was talking about color analysis, and I thought that is really interesting. Because I was always, I love colors, and I always knew that some colors suited me, some didn't. And she was talking about color analysis, which was a new industry sector, which then blossomed into the image profession. Yes. And that was in the, the late 80s. Uh, Carol Jackson wrote the color, um, color Me Beautiful, and it was a rave success in the U.S. It eventually came to the U.K. and turned into, you can become a color analyst, an image consultant. And I was drawn into that. So I did go next year at college. I actually thought, you know, I'll get involved in this. Mm -hmm. And what was even more curious was that 
the fees to go and learn were quite high. And I thought, oh, that's a shame. So somebody said to me, oh, I know a lady who's coming to do some sessions and she only charges five pounds. So I thought, oh, that sounds, sounds more, more like me. <laughs> but, with it, you know, people come into your life at certain points. And she was actually a dressmaker. And mm. we really connected on that level. We subsequently, we got involved in the image profession together. And our love was actually about the style. So the color was one side of it, but the actual garments, going back to my dressmaking and the body that goes into the dressmaking. Mm. So it's not just the garment, it's the connection between the garment and the body. Yes. And what I discovered with her, and we got involved with various parts of the image profession, we designed and looked at all the body shapes and worked out how the clothes suited the body. And then it took a next step. I, I got involved with the image profession. And in 1992, I became the president of the Federation of Image Consultants. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was, I know, and it wasn't the title or a role that I looked for. And what I've discovered in looking back at my life now is a lot of things have come to me. When I push for things, I don't get them. But when I sit back and just be, then stuff comes to me. It's a very interesting lesson. It's called, I have a term for that, and I, I am still practicing it all the time, Pauline. Yeah. Not always that good at it, but it's called the art of allowing. I like that. I mean, because we, we've all heard about the, the law of attraction, but yes. the art of allowing is different, and I would agree with you. And, I mean, the funny story there was that um, I joined the Federation of Image Consultants because I really loved the, the woman who started it, Irene Nathan, and she persuaded me onto the committee, even though I didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, and I can't resist helping, so I did. Yes. So I'm sitting on the committee for two years, and then suddenly everybody fell out with each other. Oh, no. And they all resigned, and I was the only one left. <laughs> 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 so listening to my father's voice in my head, my father always was a very – my parents were very responsible people, and my father was always saying to me, whatever happens, you must – take responsibility when it comes to you right. and i felt that this was the role i needed to to take up the federation needed me that it was early days and uh i would be the third president and you know when the the group is storming and norming and all this stuff it was it was in need of um a leader who would bring it together mm. and so i took up i took up i took up the 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 I don't know what it is, the wand. Mm. Um, and I did that role for two years, and it was very, very instrumental in, in my life at the time because it was a non paid role, but I had 10, a committee of 10, uh, two men on there as well, who were the treasurer and the, uh, whatever. I had to manage people in a way that I'd never managed people before. Right. You know, so I, I, I'd managed my kids, but managing 10 adults. Yes. In a, an organization which is still forming and storming and norming. It was a very interesting challenge. And I noted that my sort of mediating skills came in. Right. Uh, and without understanding it, I was seeing different characters and different behaviors around the table. Sure. I think my re first realization that you know, people are not all the same. And, and you might have a group of women together, but they're not all the same. And men are definitely different to women. So in that period, I worked really hard to lead this organization in a way that I felt would inspire it. And um, I did a couple of funny things, which I must share, is that if anybody knows the color profession, you know, you, you're supposed to wear the right colors. Okay. Mm. So there, mm. there is a theory, and it's true, that the right colors make you look great. But I was very against people putting things in boxes that limited their uh, ability to enable the client to be what they want to be yes you know you get a lot of people saying oh well i was made a winter but i didn't like it so i'm not going to do it so what <laughs> i used to do was i used to wear the wrong colors deliberately right when i stood up in front of my audience so i would wear a jacket which was the wrong color but i'd wear it over a shirt which was the right color right and i would i would get some people looking at me going ah, she that i'm not sure she should be wearing that so somebody inevitably would come up to me and say uh, are you a winter or why are you wearing a spring jacket and i'd go does it suit me 
they get yes. I say, well, there you go. And I just walk away. At the end of the session, I get rid of the jacket. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, maybe that's me being the rebel. Yes. I wanted, to, I wanted to challenge their perception and their perspective. I know. That's good. I like that. I'm the same. Yeah, absolutely. you got to challenge people's kind of yeah, because beliefs. Of people, and, and we've got the situation in the world now where people are stuck in, in perspectives that are just not working. Mm. And I think that was my first time of, of doing that. And I just did it instinctively because I wanted them to think beyond the box mm. because a lot, a lot of the practices – around how you dress somebody were limited to simple rules, which didn't always suit everybody. Yeah. But the essence of understanding the body, colour, shape, dirt, scale, scale, is actually really vital to understanding that when you your clothes, they don't own you, you own them. Mm. Because what I realised was when I started working then in the corporate world as a consultant doing um, – what we call a high impact communication program, but it, it embraced color and shape and style and body language and, and business etiquette and everything about who you were when you walked in the room. Yes. Did did you own it or did it own you? Mm. And that, that was where I really got into my flow of being out there in a world that helps other people to help themselves. So that became my, my um, plan of action. And it still is to help people to help themselves to be themselves, but give them the tools. Don't make it totally ethereal and, and unrealistic. Give them very, very practical tools uh, and techniques that they can use. So why does that, that outfit feel good, look good? And what message does it give? What words do you use? What, what uh, posture do you use? What language is your body and your presence saying? All those things are not dictated by the person on the stage giving a lecture, but mm. by you, the person in the um, And I, I used to do, uh, this is going on, but I, I used to love saying to audiences, and I still do, is how many of you are a difficult person? It's a fabulous mm. question. <laughs> in, any, in any audience, you'll get two or three people put their hand up because they want to be difficult. So I say, okay, that's fine. Well done. You're honest. So how many of you know a difficult person? Every hand goes up. Yeah. And I go, okay. Let's use my mathematics. I go, how does that work? You know, if every single person here knows a difficult person, and you, but only three of you here say you are, then somebody's lying to themselves. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a rebel in me, Michael. <laughs> oh, that that really get people going, won't it? Oh. Because every time you're with a difficult person, the situation is difficult. So yes. you're being difficult. You yes. may think you're, it doesn't matter whether you're right or wrong or not. It's, it's about the experience, the, yeah. the essence of who you are. And that's become core to my work now. Um, so so it, it, I'm going that, to. That was I, a fabulous period. I love that. I love that. And so, I mean, it's, you kind of went from education into running your own business, or did you kind of work for employers as well? Um, no, my, the, only, the only employer I ever had was Thompson Holidays. Right. So that was, I was an employee there for, I'd say, six and a half, seven years before we left London. Um, I never – I said, oh, actually, I tell a lie. Uh, I did have a, a job in the middle – uh, of my 40s for about a year with a management group in London. Right. Uh, but that that was, uh, I'll, I'll explain the flow because um, essentially as I got into the image world, I was a freelance entrepreneur. Got you. Um, and and my whilst, choices, you were, whilst you were bringing up the kids, you were doing this? Yes, but they yeah. by now they were like 10, 10 and 8, 12 right. and 10. They, they were Still in that young. period. Yeah. Still young. But, I mean, when I was doing – I wasn't doing – in the early 90s, I wasn't doing it full time. No. But it became increasingly busy. And, and they were then uh, teenagers. Yes. So they were in that stage where but they didn't want mum and dad around. <laughs> no. You know, so they were, dep they were becoming independent. Leave me um, alone. <laughs> my husband, yeah, my husband was freelance as well. So he was doing – 
his own things as well. He'd left right. his employer. So right. we were into this entrepreneurial kind of zone. Mm. And I was I was in partnership with a lovely American lady uh, when we were doing the high impact communication. Mm. And I mean, we had some amazing contracts with Hewlett Packard and, and a lot of pharmaceuticals. Um, and we had a big contract that took us all the way around Europe with Hewlett Packard. That was an amazing trip. So in the, the between 90 and 96, um, I was really accelerating as an entrepreneur. And I really loved going into the what I call the traditional male corporate world. Yes. So my, fa- my favorite clients were Hewlett Packard and the banks. And, uh, and interesting enough, my American business partner was much more uh, the princess, whereas I was a tomboy, she was a princess. And, and these elements, which are now my main source of focus with gender dynamic then, we would present a very uh, amazing mix to our clients because we had all these different elements the strong, the soft, the dark, the light. Um, I mean, I was brown-eyed, dark-haired, more angular, more tomboy, more logical. And she was blonde, blue eyes, tall, uh, soft, more intuitive. She was American, I was English. We had every single combination you could talk about (laughs) and talk about how it came together. And we did really good business for that period. And then... As life turns up, things change. I maybe because I was growing as a as a woman and as an entrepreneur, I, I was dissatisfied with my relationship with my husband and we eventually divorced, left each other in ninety seven. Mm-hmm. And interesting enough, my business partner, she was having similar issues and, and then she and I split up. Right. So it was a huge change point in ninety seven where I was abandoning myself to the world of the unknown. Mm. I think that's what I call it. Uh, I didn't really know what where I was going, but I knew I enjoyed working with people. And I, I wanted to develop something around what I knew, what I'd learned about people. And, you know, I've been studying my clients through the image work, and I recognized there were different types of men, different types of women. I knew there was something magical about people getting it right and and I really wanted to find out what that was yes so you know I became a single single person in all senses of the word and it was a huge challenge for me because I'm a very family person and uh, my kids were then 17 and 19 and I I didn't it it might sound strange to say I didn't intend to do what I did but it just felt that there was a need for me to express who I was um, and I, you know, I'd like to say that I did it. I managed the whole thing in the best possible way. And my husband and my ex-husband and I stayed friends um, through his life. He, he sadly has passed on now, but I was determined to as much as possible not to create destruction, but to mm. create harmony. Mm. So it's, it's it's about allowing things to happen. Um, and there was a lot of mutual understanding about the decision to break up. And as I say, you know, we, we've all stayed good friends throughout. But for me, my career was a big, big point because I, can imagine. I, suddenly, I suddenly felt everything was disappearing from under my feet. Mm. Um, and curiously, and this is one thing I think is inter- maybe interesting to readers, is sometimes you do something that seems quite um, – ridiculous to do i remember at the christmas of uh, 97 it must have been i was thinking i really need to go somewhere in the world and i need to go somewhere in the world on my own which i had never done and i had two friends in new zealand so right. i went to new zealand um and i i booked my, my a, favorite country in the world by the way oh that's great <laughs> i booked i well i booked a flight to New Zealand for the Easter time. This was Christmas. And I said to myself, right, either I will reestablish my my business life, I will have clients, I will be so busy, I will need a holiday. Yes. I was going to go for four weeks. Or I won't have got clients and I'll be so desperate, I will need a holiday. Mm. So, so this is a very strange double logic. Anyway, the latter was true. I didn't get any clients until the last week. 
But I went to do that client work. I was flying away the next two days. I got back to the station in Chorley Wood where I had left my car in the morning and it wasn't there. <gasps> and it had been stolen. And in fact, some joyriders had taken it and it was found burnt out in Hemel Hempstead. Whoa. But what happened was I flew off to New Zealand. I, I sort of did a clearing ceremony with the girlfriends there. And I came back to discover that the insurance on the car was £3,000, which enabled me to pay back the loan I'd borrowed to do the holiday and <laughs> put a high, high purchase on another car. And that's when I, I, I did some work for somebody and they asked me to go and work with them for a year. So I was temporarily an employee for a year. Yes. But that, that spawned the next part of my life because I realized I was in a great place uh, in St. James's in a posh office, but I wasn't happy. Um, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to fulfill what I wanted to do. And that was when I created Corporate Heart. So I created Corporate Heart out of my experience of temporarily being an employee again. And corporate art was all about how do people work together in a way that uh, enables them to flourish and, and that from the leadership right down to the ground floor, what did they share values? Did they share an understanding that life and business has to be integrated? So that was the first part of my now journey to really help the world become more harmonious. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was uh, 19, December 99. And again, wow. curiously, somebody inspired me into that situation and was going to work with me, but then decided to, uh, they, they needed to go on another path quite happily. Um, and out of that conversation with him came the word corporate heart. I remember phoning up a company's house and finding it was available and thinking, why has nobody else thought of this? <laughs> but you see, that's, that's life. Everything is there for you. You've just got to allow it, as you say. Yeah. So yeah. fast forward from that, yes. Corporate Heart has been a, a positive influence in my life. And I did my major piece of research on wellness in the workplace. I did a year of wellness debates in 2005. I published my reports. I thought, this is it. You know, I'm, I'm home running. Everybody's going to take up my ideas. And everybody thought it was wonderful, but organizations weren't ready for it yet. I know. Uh, the idea that everybody would love with loving intention, you know, in a big organization, just flip into that mode when you've got a very traditional male hierarchy in most cases. Mm. And another issue of women rising up through the ranks and were they being allowed and were men advocating for them? I mean, the whole of that, that last period till 2011, I was doing really good work and I had lots of uh, lots of amazing clients. And interesting again, people would come to me, the ones I pushed for I didn't get, but then suddenly, um, you know, a, a client would turn up and say, oh, no, no, definitely want that. And what you realize is you can't sell something to people that they don't want. They have mm. to be willing and want it. That's and right. And if you're talking about wholesale chain in an organization, then it has to come from the top. Correct. Yeah, totally. You know, the, the employees at the bottom might be moaning and groaning and saying, well, we want a happy place to be. And, and they can change things in their own environment. And I did a lot of work with teams in, in different levels. Mm. But if the bigger organization was slowly depleting their energy, it was very hard to turn it around. Totally. And, and if, if the profit motive was the only thing and not people... Um, it was it was going to be a challenge, so I I was I did really well and I had lots of very good contracts. But in two thousand and and six, after my year of wellness debates, which were were hailed as the best debates ever, I had speakers and uh, you know I had eminent speakers. I had it so well organized and talking about all the issues of good wellness and health at work and people being valued. I still didn't get all the major contracts. No. So I climbed a mountain. <laughs> I know. And I, it's so interesting, isn't yeah. it, that time, because you're getting close to the period where I started getting involved in that sector. Mm. Yeah. And I remember just one very quick story, whilst you can catch some breath and have a drink, <laughs> um, 
one quick story that I, I was I went to visit and had an inquiry for a very major uh, building society in the north of the United Kingdom. And I sat down with the HR director and HR manager. The HR director was male. The HR manager was female. And mm. I had something that I'd brought over from America called the wellness inventory. And there was a, um, there was a, 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 a slice on the wellness inventory wheel, a segment, which was called love. Mm -hmm. right? That was the name for that particular segment. And when people took the wellness inventory, it was a questionnaire and they filled all these bits and pieces out. And it, the, the love bit related to their relationships with themselves and with the significant other person in their lives. And um, I will never, ever to this day forget what this guy said to me. He turned around and he went, when he saw it, his face just went white. And he went, oh, no, 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 we, we can't have that. We don't do love here. That, those were the exact <laughs> words he said. Because I I he, he, he thought it was some sort of kind of hippie movement, mm -hmm. you know, love and, and whatever. He said, oh, no, no, you know, we can't have that. We don't do love here. And that was it. That was the end of the meeting, basically. And I, I tried to, because oh, I was... You know, desperate to get this client because it was very early on in my business journey and Ooh. I took everything really personally, <laughs> including that one. And it wasn't even my flipping, what's it, you know, my inventory. And um, yeah, I was so deflated when I left that meeting and drove back home after that. It was like, seriously, people don't get it. And, well, and it was just far too early. Yeah, we, we've still got the problem. Oh, I, mean, I, I totally get it. I mean, I, I've got a very logical, mathematical mind, mm. and I see it as really straightforward that there's only love and fear. So love has to be an energy. And when you look at client relationships, customer relationships, customer loyalty, you're talking about love. You know, why, why do we? Why do we? Why are we loyal to a product? Because we love it. Correct. But you've got this element and. I have to say it is the male element that's been stopping this progress since we shifted from the manufacturing world to a you know through to an information world and now a digital world. It is the, the, the male energy that's still blocking love and yet we know that love is important, is essential. And I had the exact same thing, I mean corporate heart, heart, the heart of the business. You know, if every single heart is ticking in the right way, then the business accelerates. And I mean, I went through all of that so often, clients saying, you know, yeah, we really get it. And I mean, the, the, the wellness survey that I produced was well ratified. One of the major questions in the survey was, do people in your organization still work even when a team, I, are, are they pushed to the limit? And everybody said yes. So, so basically, you know, we, we work hard and we work well, but we're exhausting and we're going to die. Yes. And I stood in a, a, a Lutheran chapel once in Amsterdam to present to a, an audience of auditors. Mm. And this was about wellness and corporate heart. And I started by saying, of course, dead bodies are not very profitable at work. <laughs> it's my rebel. My rebel. See, and the, all these auditors looked at me. They were 95% men. And I said, well, unless you're an undertaker, then I suppose dead bodies are quite good. <laughs> and they kind of – they were, <laughs> And then I said, you know, because unwell bodies are very costly. Yes. You know, when you've got a lot of OC health cases and you've got people, not just the cases, you've got people coming in who are despondent, dismayed, they don't want to be there. You don't get the work out of them. No. It's like it's a no-brainer, but they they like the math, but they don't like the, the sentiment. And what was interesting, I mm. took them through a few exercises, one of which was um, about connection. So I was going to get them to shake hands. But I started off by saying, right, now um, now we're going to hug each other. And there was a visible in-breath of <laughs> uh, in the audience. And I said, but I suspect you don't really want to do that. But if you'd like to stand up and just give your the next person a hug with your hand. So basically I, I got them to do like a, a double handshake. So right. shaking with the other hand. 
just to show them that if you touch somebody, you get a connection. Mm. And so they laugh. But, you know, this was the male auditor mindset. Mm. We said, you can't factor love into the bottom line. So in that period, I was also developing my ideas on gender dynamics. And this is important because if we remember, and I'm sure everybody does, that 2008, Lehman Brothers crashed. I know it well because they, they crashed and it was celebrated. Well, not it was remembered this year, literally last week. Because they yeah. crashed on my birthday. <laughs> oh, I will so never good. ever forget it. <laughs> yeah. You see, when that when that happened uh, and there was a, a lot of um you know, news headlines, you know, if it had been Lehman Sisters would it have happened? I mean it was a it was a great journalist line. Yes. Um but I, I became more and more aware that the issue about women was mounting. So this is 2008, and now we're 2018. We're talking about 10 years. Mm. A lot has happened in 10 years. Yes. And and so I was really looking at, and I was working there with a lovely lady called Alana Mitchell, who was, again, different to me as a woman. She was much more intuitive, softer, whereas I was more logical, if you like, harder. Um, but we started seeing, you know, there was something – going on and my mathematical mind said right we can map this out so it pulled back all the stuff i had learned when i was in the image world about body shapes and types because i started observing that women who stood straight and had an angular body frame like me were more likely to be mathematicians and engineers and the women who were more like alana and soft and like my other business partner they were more likely to be intuitive they would be in professions that needed that intuition yes um, HR, training, coaching. And it was the same with men. Was, there was a variation on shape and body and the style. And that's where I created the gender dynamics map, which right. literally just because I'm a because you know I'm a geometrist, I needed to map it out. I needed to know how I could explain where I was to other people. Mm -hmm. So if I behaved in a masculine minded way, it didn't mean to say I was pretending to be a man. It was just my natural way. Uh, but women would sometimes see me as being too aggressive because I was being more straight line thinking. Yes. Um, and also these, the gentle guy, the feminine minded man who was more like to be a servant leader and, and kinder and gentle was seen by his tough male colleagues as not being good enough. Mm. And, I, and I had that an example of, going into um, a bank, Barclays Bank, I think it was, and we were looking at the issue of uh, female banker, female bankers who were helping clients were very good at their job, but, of course, they had babies, and when they had one, two, three babies, they would start leaving. Yeah. No surprise. And the men were trying to work out how they could stop this departure because they were losing talent. And I showed the gender map to a, a guy, and he said, oh, well, that's really, really interesting. Yes, I'm one of those gentle-minded guys. So I said, yes, right, can we do a business? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think I could explain that to the men. <laughs> so it's like your guy who says, I can't take with love. And, yes. and so one of the things I've realized is you've got to find the right people. And there are people who want to lead the world in a different way. And I think in the 10 years since Lehman Brothers went down, a lot has happened. Uh, it's, it's vibrating at a very fast rate, I think, to extremes. Um, and, and really, my, my focus of my work has come into that focus on why are we not working together better? Mm. Because, to be honest, it's such a waste of time arguing when we've got a lot of things to do. I, I mean, I've been very simplistic here, but that's my truth. I, I have an article that I've just came across literally seconds before we came on to this call, right? And there is a section on LinkedIn that I didn't even know existed. And I was doing a bit of digging and it's a, it's a section called uh, What People Are Talking About Now, right? Oh. And that they... So somebody's put an article on and they're obviously commenting on it. And you've got, for instance, bids for Sky TV go to auction, 653 readers. 
uh, Bezos, the Amazon CEO, to put people in space. 1,256 mm -hmm. readers. Um, the Secret to Retaining New Skills, 2,800 readers. Streaming is Giving Hollywood Grief, 4,600 readers. Um, needles Pulled Amid Fruit Crisis, no idea what that means, 10,000 readers. <laughs> <laughs> McDonald's tax deal not illegal. Four thousand five hundred readers. Now I'm saying saying these titles on purpose and the amount of readers. Yeah. And then there is this one which stood out. Married men make the most. Study forty eight thousand readers. <laughs> <gasps> and and the head the topic That's at the amazing. I know. So at the top it says. Um, married men make the most. Study. Married men earn significantly more than others, including unmarried men, unmarried women and married women. The Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis surveyed people employed in 2016 with at least a high school diploma and found that for women, working life still presents a seemingly inevitable loss of parity, according to Bloomberg. Yes. Perhaps surprisingly, Unmarried men earn as much or little as women. The Fed noted that men who make more may be more likely to marry, not earn more because they do. Right. So they're saying yeah. they, they're likely to marry. So men that already earn more are more likely to marry, not just mm. because they earn anyway, not earn yeah. more because they are married <laughs> type of yes. thing. But what what your this this whole discussion that we're getting into now is so appropriate because you yeah. can see when you're saying so much has changed in the last ten years, but it's so on the tip of everybody's tongue. You got all these articles, none of them go over five ten. Well, there's the highest was ten thousand. Yeah. The next one is this one is five times more read. Yes. Or being talked about, I should say, uh, five times more. No, it says readers. Yeah, five times more being read than the highest one on that list. In the now, what would be would be very interesting, and this is where my 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 love of statistics is mm. comes out because the figures are amazing. Who is reading it? I know. What's what is the demographic profile of that readership? Because yeah. that would be very interesting. Mm. And I don't know whether. LinkedIn could estimate that, but you know, is it men? Are men reading that, or women reading that, or which which of those demographic groups are reading well, the article? Yeah, and I'm sure they would have that in the background. Yeah. they they would I know that because they out. collect the data on all of us, don't they? Whatever we do on these platforms, they have the information somewhere. But yeah. I guess you'd need to get in touch with them directly and ask them the question. Yes, but I'll send you this article because. I mean, I, I think yeah, it's, please do. Um, and I just came across it just literally seconds before we went on the call, which is just weird. And I thought, oh, if the opportunity comes up, I'll raise it. And so coming back I, I to think one of the things I, w hmm. I think maybe is here and it fits in with the story is what is most important in the life of a man and a woman at, at various stages of their life, but certainly. Um, I made a choice. I made choices in my life in the last ten years, mm. which were sometimes not commercially sensible, mm. but because I wasn't happy with where I was. And I'm thinking, how do I shift and change this? Because I could continue going on networking, you know, pushing for client work. I'm sure we'll get it. But if I'm not meeting my vision target my mission target my legacy target mm. then do i need to do something different yeah in 2006 quite literally i walked up a mountain i took myself out of my normal comfort zone and i went on a trip to kenya mm. and i walked up to five four thousand two hundred meters with a group of people i didn't know mm. it was an amazing experience and what i learned when i got to four thousand two hundred meters was I was on the wrong mountain in my life. Right. And in fact, I then started changing things and, and almost as the art, you know, the art of allowing. I, and my philosophy of life, it, it all starts with me. 
Mm. If I don't get the me right, then nothing else happens. Correct. So I started looking at the, my my core philosophy, which I've always had, is that if I know me, then I can know you and me, and then I can know we. So it's three arrows. And if I don't know me, and I don't know, I'm not true uh, to my own values and my honesty and my 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 views. I can't really meet you in any relationship. So whether that's you or me or a client or my mom or dad or brothers or uh, or husband or whoever it is, I need to understand who I am. But I don't, I don't make me the most important part of the me and you. It's about flowing into that relationship. Yeah. But it's it's holding true to your altruistic view of life. And the third part is is the we is the bigger we, the the bigger family, the community, the world. Yes. So instead of the world controlling us, we actually can influence and manage to impact the world. And that's what I see is happening and shifting. So when I came back from the mountain, I vowed never to walk up another mountain, but I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I walked up a mountain in the Atlas. And again, it was part of me just challenging myself. Mm. And then I, I still worked. I was still doing corporate artwork. And I was really, interesting enough, I did a piece of research on what do men think men are doing now and that was in 2010 that's on my corporate heart website and it's a that was a, a precursor to what i'm doing now with the interviews with men that i did with you as well michael yes so i was really focused on what why why are we stuck why are women still not making it i know my sisters i worked with more than women but where was the stuck point with men so what did men think about men that was my first impact into that area mm. and then in 2011 um i had changed my life again by moving out of my residence and freeing up my capital just to be in a rental space so i went back to sort of ground zero at the age of uh 62 and uh, 61 62 and the summer of uh, 2011 um my mother passed on very suddenly which was she was 93 and a half, so it was, it was sad and not sad. Mm. But it was, it was a big shift for me because my father had passed on and I was, she hadn't been well and I was sort of not looking after her, but she was in my mind most of the time. So with her parting, I became freer. I didn't have my residence. I was just flowing. And in fact, I was just about to leave one flat to find another one, and I didn't even know where I was going. So literally, I was a nomad at the end of November, and I got invited to go to a conference in Budapest, uh, which was about a small and medium enterprises, the World Union of Small and Medium Enterprises. And that's where I met my now husband, who is American. Yes. So he came from Las Vegas, and I came from London, <laughs> to a conference that neither of us wanted to be at. <laughs> and, and we met, and, and over a period of six months of writing emails, we fell in love. And then I came to America. He proposed. I said yes. And it sounds like a fairy sale. It is. We, yes. It hasn't all been easy because we've had operations to deal with. His, not mine. And we've also been in Malaysia for four years and then come back here. Wow. But the reason I tell that story is that they were not for, all those decisions were not based on commercial reality. It was based on my life. But mm -hmm. I wasn't in a position where I could just stop working. So it was also about how do I manage what I have and what I give to the world mm -hmm. wherever I am. So when we landed in Malaysia, having got married and not been able to stay in England or America for various immigration reasons, and him needing to recover from operations, we ended up in Malaysia, which I had no idea about. I didn't even know anything about the culture. But I, I actually got lots of very good contracts with uh, women especially women entrepreneurs, but also with men and women. And I really started looking into how does gender dynamics become a reality in any culture. So whether it's a Muslim culture, Hindu culture, Catholic culture, whether it's an old culture or young or it's millennials, everybody at essence is, a, is defined by their biology and their physicality and their sexual preferences by who they are. Yes. But the whole energy around gender dynamics became much more important to me. Um, and that's why I came to America to for my husband to be back in America, which is good for him and it's good for me. And California is a very 
open-minded culture. Yes. Uh, and the issue about men and women and the boardroom and all the stuff we've been talking about is still there. And I've, it's become more polarized by sexual harassment cases and mm, the Me Too movement. Yeah, yeah. So I've got a couple of things to, to yeah. interject, and I hope you're still okay for time, but if you're not, then let me know and we can round it off. But a couple of things to, to mention there. First of all, about California. When I was in the industry, um, our designers, fabric designers or garment designers that I worked with, used to travel to California to look at what was happening in swimwear because California led in swimwear mm. the direction of design in terms of fabric and yes. also texture and color and so we would get all of our inspiration out of California to put on our story or on our mood boards to present to our biggest client which was really only one client which was Marks and Spencer at the time and so most of the you know major design ideas come out of California. Yes. So if you think about all the tech and Silicon Valley and everything, it's all California, right? So good, bad or indifferent, whatever we think about the tech and social media and everything else, and that mm. could be a discussion for a whole, <laughs> whole other podcast, but it, it all comes out of California. And yes. So that's one thing because it's interesting that you – we're in the kind of garment sector for a while and in design and colour mm. as well. And you've ended up yeah. in California where I believe, personally, I might be wrong, but a lot of the industry goes to to find out what the trends are going to be. So maybe it's absolutely the right place for you to be to, to set the trend of what you're doing in the world, if you know what I mean. And well, I, I hope so. <laughs> Well, and it's a good place to launch it, I believe, for people yes. to start noticing it more and, and, you know, taking it up. And then the other thing to mention to you, there's a, there is a, a lady who runs a podcast and she works for Recode. And the podcast is called Recode Decode. I think her name is Cara Swisher. Mm. And I was listening to an interview that she did a couple of weeks ago, a lady called Nancy Jo Sales who has just done a documentary called Swiped and it premiered on HBO. Don't know if you've got HBO, but it premiered on HBO on September the 10th. And it's all about the kind of Tinder. Um, oh, yes. And yeah, I did listen to a bit of that. Yes, that was interesting. Yeah, hooking up in the digital age. And there's this whole thing around yes. tech and how the tech is continuing to... Um, continued the whole abuse thing of women, um, not so much men, because, but also, yeah, some women putting themselves up there to be used, perhaps, but mm. also men going there to want to make use of women. Um, there's some terms in there that I didn't even know about, you know, the term hooking up. I don't even yeah. understand what that really means. But I think it's kind of having casual whatevers with each other. It's called hooking up. And that's what people are using ten Tinder for. And they're talking about women, very, very young age, you know, teenager, 13, 14 years of age being on these platforms. And although they're now saying they're not allowed on these platforms, they can't, you know, they can't. But somebody puts their age up as 18 or whatever the age is yeah, now. You can't tell. You yeah. can't tell if they're, if they're 14 and the same happened with Facebook. You know, my stepsons were on Facebook when I they were 14. The whole, yes. I mean, the whole thing, Michael, comes back to love, doesn't it? It's mm. like, and what, is, and what is love? And I talk about this in uh, in my book, which isn't published yet, but there, there are two books in the offering. Yes. And... And the reason that I focus on magical conversations, which I'd love to bring in here, is that people have some people have said, like the man who said, "Oh, you can't do love in the business." Yes. Some people say to me, "Oh, you shouldn't use magical conversation because it it puts people off." But if you think about love or fear, what are the conversations you have when you're in fear? They're certainly mm -hmm. not magical. 
No. <laughs> you know, they, they, you, you need to go into sort of non-conflict resolution or, uh, you know, the, the courageous conversations. There's lots of people out there doing conversations. And the reason I picked magical conversations is there's something around magic and the magician that, that enables us to think about the unknown and the impossible and the unbelievable. And I think that's where we've got to in our world. I want to use love as a as a, a wand. You know, when you wave a wand of love, wave the wand of magic, then you feel excited, you feel attracted, you feel, you know, when you tune into somebody else in that state of love. And I'm not necessarily talking about intimate love. That's one level of love. Mm. I'm talking about familial love, social love, uh, professional love. Why shouldn't we be in that experience mm. when we're working, when we're working a huge part of our day. Yes. You know, um, if it's not love, then it's fear and whatever drives from fear, which is frustration, depression, anger, control, mm. you know, marginalization, mm. everything. Do we want that or do we want the stuff that comes from love? That, yes. that I think is what we have to choose. And yeah, it's not just about money. I mean, I talk about helping people to monetize their conversations through the magic of gender dynamics. It's a choice, you know, if, if we're in an environment with people who we're tuned into, things happen, you're much more creative, and whether that's going to be ending up as a soulmate love and an intimacy in a marriage, I don't know, but it could be just you in a great family situation or a team, you enjoy, you enjoy the party more. Yes. There seems to be a desperate need for people to find love, mm. whereas love is not something you find, you have it. It's given mm -hmm. to you. Yeah. You know, when you're born, you don't come out saying, oh, shall I choose love or fear? <laughs> yes. You know, now, sometimes we're born into, some people are sadly born into a fearful situation, um, and they have fearful things happen in their life, you know, yes. abuse, uh, marginalization, poverty, whatever it is. But you can look at every situation in the world. Yeah. You can look at the most poverty-stricken, desperate places, and you'll find somebody who smiles. Mm. You know, we know the story of, of the guy in Auschwitz who, you know, he survived the experience because he had the right mindset. Um, you know, the, the people who lost like, arms and legs or born with that arm, who, who, who smile and overcome adversity. And I'm, I'm just saying there is a choice. Yeah. And, and the whole issue with Tinder, which I don't know enough about, but no. the question for me is why... Why are people desperate to find love mm. when, in fact, they can feel it inside their body and attract it to them? It's the art of allowing. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I and we mean, seem to be in a world where we're so conditioned through education and controls and and parental controls and financial controls and you know to we we, we always seem to be doing things we don't want to do. Mm. And I was talking yesterday to a group, and I said, what are your innate natural skills that you were born with? Not the ones you learned. Mm. Those, the ones that you were born with are the ones that you should accelerate with. Yeah. And those will be the ones that you're most happy with. Um, and I remember working with some clients at, in, in the Met Police in London, and one guy was showing him through various profiling tools and my work with gender and that, what he his natural gifts were, and he said, "Oh, that's yeah, that's true, that's true." But that's not what they ask you to do here. So I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Well, what they do here is they they find out what you can't do, and then they make you go and do it." Yeah. So that that you become omnicompetent, and that's really what when we're, we you know you've got to learn maths, you've got to learn language, you should learn science, you should do this, you should do that. Why? Why not do what you do best? Mm. Be aware of all the other stuff. But in an organization, if somebody is a good people person, they're a valuable asset. Yeah. I, um, my nephew, Dom, he was telling me that he was, he was re-employed at a company which he had left. They asked him back because they said, I don't know what it is you do, but when you're around, everybody seems to be happier and you, you, you help people get through their problems. Mm. So we want you back for that. How do you define that on a, on a job list? Mm. How do you define the value of a woman who has had 
years and years of experience, but it's not the one on your job sheet because you wanted her to have 15 years as a CEO. Mm. She happened to have been a mum and a business owner. It, we, we're very stereotyped by what we think is valuable. I know. I know. And that's what I'm trying to get through. So in my interviews with men, which I've been doing, and I call it Men of the Future Now, mm. uh, it's like, what is the wisdom that you guys have got that we need to listen to as women of significance today? That's my other program for women. Mm. So that we don't fight our way into the top. We take love and we use our own voice to share and care and listen and work out how the two halves come together. Yes. Because the yin and the yang, the, the, the masculine, the feminine, the energy that we have, the straight line and the, and the, cir- the, the curve, the, the box and the, the circle, mm-hmm. coming back to my original geometry, that's what we need. We need the straight line direction and we need the curve of beauty. Mm. And, and you look at buildings now, there are many buildings built with, foundations that are solid but they curve in their upper aperture oh, you know that it's incredible that, you say that i was on yeah. a i was in the city center of birmingham this morning on a bus going to a meeting and i was standing outside birmingham library which is very very square well it's a cubes mm. shape but on the outside it's full of circles yeah <laughs> You, you look everywhere now. In, I mean, you look in nature. Mm. Again, everything, every form, everything that is form is made of line and space and substance. So there's nothing between the straight the straight line and the curve. Just think about it. So mm. men, men, men can be very straight line in their conversation. They might often use tell instead of ask. Mm. Uh, a, a direct imperative rather than indirect imperative. Mm. But the masculine is also very direct as opposed to the feminine, which is indirect. Yes. And what I'm saying is we need both. So we need the, we need the direction uh, and the freedom of choice, the flexibility and the flow. You know, you just look at the energy. So the energy of a magical conversation is that you know who you are, so you know where you are on the map. You know whether you're a strong masculine energy, strong feminine energy, male, female. Then you observe other people who are in that space to have a magical conversation. And then you come into the magical conversation without judgment and without anger and without wanting to control the flow. Yes. You can't, you can't control the flow of a river. You know, we try and put a dam, but it then mounts up. You, you, the, the river keeps on flowing. Mm. Mm. And, and it will pull everything into the flow. So the, the goal is to be understand who you are, mm. who they are, mm. and what the collective energy is. That's my mission. And, and the reason I'm studying men is that I think this, it's something that's been uh, left out of the equation. And interestingly enough, I'm getting very interested inquiries from large women's organizations who haven't let men in at all. And I mean that by, you know, that because they're, they're looking at the issues of women, uh, that men are not a priority in their agenda at the moment. No. So the, 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 the magic of listening to men on their own, listening to women on their own, is that you then bring it together and the gender dynamic map creates a, a new um, mixture of the, the two territories mm. and it allows us to form pathways across and the, and the reason it's different to when i was a kid is the numbers it comes back to numbers you see there's more of us and we're all out there doing the same things we all have technology at our fingertips yeah and so the world the world has been made equal by technology but the characters are still beautifully different <laughs> and and they need to be different to some yeah. extent um we can't be we're not the same we're not built the same um but there has to be a level of understanding and respect and that's what yeah. i yeah i mean literally today um and i forget who it was now I, I don't want to mention this person's name anyway but somebody i connected to quite recently on linkedin and i saw a post she put up 
And this was around what people were posting in terms of messages to her. Um, and it's just so, yeah, so I'll just read the post. It says, Am I the only female businesswoman who finds it highly irritating to receive advances from men on this forum, forum being LinkedIn? I'm a professional businesswoman. Do not expect to receive unsolicited kisses and hello, beautiful messages. For the record, I'm happily married. And last time I checked, this is not a dating app. And there's been already, mm. this was four hours ago, there's been 78 likes and 39 comments already. So mm. people are already, you know. Um, well, I, I applaud her. I mm. applaud her because I, um, I think it's the challenge of this open digital world. And that's, you know, on LinkedIn, I wouldn't expect to be advanced like that. No. On Facebook, it happens all the time and it's really irritating. Mm. Because I, I'm really interested in how men are feeling when they're serious about this issue that I'm dealing with. I don't need them to, um, to come in and say, "Oh, hello, beautiful. You know, can I, can I sign up with you?" Mm. It's like women don't do that. So, so what, why should men do it? Yeah. So, so a guy responds to this, uh, and he says, so he puts her quote up. He goes, "In my own personal experience, women are just." as bad for unsolicited messages on here, judging by some I receive. Well, I've been, <laughs> on, I've been on LinkedIn for 40, 14 years and I've never had any. Writing no. posts like this from a woman's, women's only perspective keeps us all further apart in the goal of absolute equality. Yeah. And so... Well, I, I, it... It, it's a very, very challenging situation, Michael. Mm. I mean, I had this recently. I was, I had a meeting, and the woman I met was totally on board with what I was talking about. Her driver, who happened to be a young man who was her, her daughter's boyfriend or something, he turned up. When she tried to explain what it was to him, he got very defensive and said, oh, you shouldn't label people. Um, he said, we're all the same. And I said, um, I'm really sorry to disagree, but, you know, you're a young male American and I'm an old white baby boomer Brit. Mm. There's nothing that's the same about us. <laughs> and I mean, I think we get very, when people are defensive, I challenge them as to why they're being defensive. Mm. But it comes down to love. And I mean, love in a pure energy sense. Mm. I know. The challenge is we, the people are not aware of their impact. No. Um, and places like LinkedIn are not a place for chatting up. I don't think Facebook should be either. No. That, that, I mean, it's totally inappropriate. And it just, I, I just am embarrassed that men are doing this to women. You know, there is yeah. just no respect there. Yeah. And I, I think it's, and there should be a way where, well, you can report people to say that there are inappropriate behavior or whatever, and LinkedIn will take it up and they will, ba they will ban them, you know, if they get enough complaints. So I think these people need to be yes. highlighted and, and told about because they need to get off there, quite frankly, because if they do it with one, they're going to do it with others. And it's just not appropriate anymore. But to it do comes these back to, and it's, I think it's we, never been appropriate. <laughs> no. And I mean, um, I, I, w I will have to go now, Michael. But yes, what I, yes. I think the, the main issue is, and I'm challenged with this now, is what is appropriate behavior and why does inappropriate behavior turn up? Mm. And, and for me, it's about our initial grounding as a human being. So I think it comes right from our upbringing and, and our, uh, the, the, the mores and the moral code that we've been brought up with. Mm. Uh, and is that in res respecting everybody, which means you don't do anything malicious. So you don't chat up women or men or women don't chat up men without some understanding that this is a, it, it doesn't, you know, it must never be malicious. Mm. It doesn't, it doesn't go in for the kill straight away. But that's true of every conversation. So, you know, how do we, allow and understand for all the differences that we bring to the table. We're not taught this in school. 
No. We're not taught this from ground zero. That's um, right. Very often we have a religious upbringing or a cultural upbringing or a location upbringing, which is very controlled. Mm. And then we get into this, well, I'm right, you're wrong argument, and that's hopeless. Um, and fundamentally, we need to have a values-based, principle, love-oriented uh, upbringing. Mm. That when we get to the more intimate needs, we come at that from an understanding that we, you know, we, we come in it from a loving intention point of view, not a desperation, not a control, not manipulation. Yeah. We have to have some of those core conversations everywhere in the workplace. What is appropriate behavior? What mm. is inappropriate behavior? Mm. When does it cross the line? And we treat, we're trying to do it by legal process now in the workplace. And that's always dangerous. I know. Pauline. Um, and I don't know how we resolve that, but I do know we need to have more magical conversations. <laughs> and, and well done for everything you're doing. And uh, thank you. And I, you know, and I know that lots of people are going to be taking this area so much more seriously as time goes on and the yes. sooner the better. And I hope they take on board all of your principles and your teachings well, and everything, all your research you've done on this topic. And you continue well, to bit, do. One, bit, uh, one little bit of advice I would say to people is that mm. if everyone in a situation which is uh, happy, defensive, angry, whatever, take a step back and say, what's my part in this yeah. without being defensive? Just be honest with yourself and what is it you want mm. and what can you embrace that is good and positive and loving yeah. and just set your mind there. Well, thank you for sharing your story, Pauline. And how can people get in touch with you? Uh, just tell us your different domains and well, sites well, that you are um, active on. Pauline, Pauline Crawford Oms. So Pauline Crawford or Pauline Crawford Oms. But Oms is my now married name with my American husband, Jim Oms. Um, I'm on Facebook, uh, Pauline Crawford Oms. And, and I have a public page there where all the men's interviews are posted, which is Pauline T. Crawford Oms, that's T for Teresa. Um, but also I'm on LinkedIn, Pauline Crawford, and Twitter as Pauline Crawford, and Instagram as Pauline, either Pauline Crawford or Pauline Crawford Oms. Um, there will be a new website very soon called Miss Magical Conversation, so I have to wait for that. Um, but essentially, if you Google me, you'll find me. I send me an, uh, an invitation to connect, certainly through LinkedIn. Or Facebook. Fantastic. Enjoy the weather in Florida. I can Wait, hear California. California. Not sorry, Florida. sorry, sorry, California. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, totally the other side. Enjoy the yeah. weather in California and the beach and the mountains and everything else. Yeah. It's absolutely pouring with rain just right now. <laughs> Here. Oh, no. um, and I will speak to you very soon. And if you do, I know you sometimes come back to UK. Let's let's do lunch or coffee uh, yeah, when you're back or when you have time. Um, yeah. And we'll speak soon. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Have a great day. You too. Staying Alive UK. Share your story. 